So again, the theme for this month is a world without hate. And last week we talked about the strength of empathy. And this week we're going to talk about living with stress and fear and anxiety because we all do. <laughs> we all do. We all try to just push it aside. Or I know a lot of times, especially in our quote spiritual community, it's seen as almost a weakness if we have some kind of anxiety or stress or fear and we, we can't, you know, and we express that. And yet it's a regular human experience to have those things. I'm going to read a couple of definitions for you. These definitions are from a site called Very Well Mind. Um, first is stress. And stress is defined as any type of change that causes physical, emotional, or psychological strain. It's our actual body's response that anything that requires action or attention. It's like our body saying, you need to pay attention to this a little bit <laughs> and make some decisions because there is a change in either our physical or emotional or just our world in general. I want to point out that it is a regular body response. I like the way they find it that way. Um, because again, sometimes we think if we're feeling these things, we're somehow less. And yet it's part of our actual intuitive system <laughs> playing the way it needs to. Fear is defined as a natural, powerful, and primitive human emotion. It involves a universal biochemical response as well as a high individual emotional response. Fear alerts us to the presence of danger or the threat of harm, whether that danger is physical or psychological. Again, <laughs> it's a trigger to tell us, it's a, it's a recognition in us to pay attention to something in our world. They are really part of our intuition. And instead of pushing away to recognize that it's built into us for a lovely purpose, right? We don't have to dwell there. That's, that's when it becomes an issue is when we just dwell there. But it, in 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, I remind you to flame the gift of God, which is in you. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. So we have this power within us to use when we recognize things like stress and fear. Muji says to learn what to give attention to and to develop our intuition. That this, these things are the guideposts of faith. So to start looking on things like big nasty words like stress and fear and anxiety, there's actual little guideposts for ourselves to know when to reach into that reservoir of faith that beingness, that isness, that true self that is with us to guide us through those kinds of situations that our body are saying, we need to pay attention to this right now. <laughs> this is something you need to pay attention to. And in a lot of ways, is, are we recognizing that strength and are we allowing that light to actually shine? Do we know that we are strong enough to bear our own light in these situations and to not shrink from making the decisions that may be necessary. I know we talk a lot about we need to detach ourselves from stress or we need to somehow separate from anxiety. But detachment doesn't mean disengagement disengagement sometimes in the fear we squeeze so much you know that <laughs> and there's a story from alan watts that he talks about a little girl that got a new bunny right she was gifted a bunny and she actually squeezed that poor little bunny to death with love because she was afraid it was going to get away and then her wish for it not to get away and her fear of that, she squeezed it so much that it wasn't there anymore. So 
it's something that will happen. Fear is something that will, that we are afraid something will happen to our world. And yet something's always happening to our world <laughs> and we create more stress and fear for ourselves when we try to hold on to the permanence of something that we already have that we're comfortable with you know to recognize that everything is change all the time i think most of you in here are our parents <laughs> or or have been around little people and they are constant change all the time um my almost 14 year old grew like two inches in literally two months is, is, you know, and that's some, a change that you can actually see happening, but there's all these other changes that sometimes we don't see. And we want so bad sometimes, how many of you've heard, you know, I just want to put you in a box and keep you there. Like the little girl with her bunny. <laughs> yeah. I just want to keep this the way it is right now. And then we create these stress and fear and anxiety moments because we don't want it to shift from where it is that we're comfortable. And if anything as hot as anything in the last two years is that everything changes all the time. <laughs> and you might as well belt yourself into the roller coaster and say we once in a while <laughs> instead of fretting the ride to even begin with. Um, Tareen McKenna she says that worry is betting against yourself. Betting against yourself. And that, in the grand scheme of things, we don't even know enough to worry. We don't have the big picture. From our perspective, as human, we just don't have it. And probably my favorite quote out of all this is um, Reverend John White, um, who is a friend of mine, he used to say, what are you worried about? If you know that God is your daddy, what the heck are you afraid of? <laughs> and he would say it that way. If you know that God is your daddy, what are you afraid of? It's like not resisting that experience of fear and not resisting that experience of stress, but to know and remind ourselves constantly that they are wonderful clues to where intuition is leading us for the next choice. Because we are only able to be in this present moment, always. And Deuteronomy 33:27 says, underneath are the everlasting arms. So in this present moment, always, we are held up folded in, surrounded by that love of the universe always. And we can tap into that. There are a few things though, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to share with you next is right from the work of um, James Dillard Freeman. And he talks about how there are many ways we can go from an everyday standpoint um, that we, we drip in stress and fear to working with our intuition and building that and to do that in times where we're not super feeling it. I think always we have a little bit in the background, at least somewhere, you know, that we have to deal with. And yep, in those tiny moments, when it's in the fading in the background, that's when we can build up our awareness and work on these things so that when we get hit with that, we have all the tools for it. So one, there's three steps here I'm gonna talk about. And the last one, I'm gonna ask you to work with me with it in a, in a tiny meditation. But one is to check in on how we are on a regular basis, to take that time, like we talked about last week with the empathy, take the time, you know, right first thing in the morning, how are you? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are the things that are going through your head? How does your body feel? <laughs> you know, just check in with yourself. Know what your baseline is moving forward after you wake up so that you have a better understanding of how it is hitting you. And is it from the outside? Is it something you're generating? You know, just a little five minute check-in. 
and honor our physical experience. This is number two. Honor yourself as a human, which means for yourself. And this is different for everybody. Nobody can tell you what is exact for you except you. But what is your proper hydration? What is your proper food? <laughs> what is your proper exercise for you? Um, what are your unique physical needs? Because when we are in optimal physical form for ourselves, you know, not somebody else's physical form, <laughs> right? Olympic athletes have a different <laughs> makeup than the most of us. But whatever our optical physical form is, our body will process those fear and stress and anxiety signals better. We will be able to know that these are things that we need to take care of, that we need to make decisions about. This past week, um, there was a, a book library day at um, the International Institute in Erie. And I had signed up, the, the kids and I, we're gonna be part of the volunteers that would either pass out books or help at a craft table or whatever. It was only a couple hours long. Well, only that morning, it super rained. <laughs> so they weren't sure what was gonna happen with the rest and they had to set up. So they moved all of that inside into this pretty cramped area. <laughs> and it was this little thinning hallway with this little teeny room and there was no back exit. There was only one way in and out. So people were crowded this way and that way with all these tables. And since it was inside and crowded, everybody had masks on. So not only are you claustrophobic this way, now we're all claustrophobic <laughs> this way as well. And my youngest started to not handle it well, not at all. <laughs> and it took me a little while to figure out what his signals were because he could, he didn't, we're still working on, now he's 12, so we got some time but to know when he is feeling a certain way that it's time to remove yourself, you know, that it's okay. And we had talked before that, that it was gonna be outside. So he was very comfortable with that because he knows he can go wander off and then come back, wander off and come back, that wasn't available. So right away, he didn't like it. He told me everything that was wrong with the situation. And it sounded like little preteen complaining, right? And it took me probably 10 minutes to figure out this was more than preteen complaint. By the time I figured it out and got him back out to the car, he was in full blown anxiety mode. And it's a good thing we hit the car when we did <laughs> because it was that way the whole way home. And then once we got home, he was able to start calming down. I guess my point is to know our signals, right? I don't know that it was bad. And this is the conversation we had because he's like, it's all my fault we laughed, this and that. And he was beating himself up even more. I said, I don't care that we laughed. <laughs> That's not the issue. The issue is knowing your signals before it gets so bad that you start talking bad about yourself or start doing things that aren't good for yourself. So that's what we have to work on, <laughs> you know? And, and are we aware of that for each other? I think sometimes, cause I was reminded, cause it's been a while because of the last year, the way it's been, we've not been in places that's been that confined, right? <laughs> and it's just, nobody's doing it. And all the places, even the festivals I've taken them to, they've been outside. We, we've not been like, even if there were lots of people, but are we willing not only to look at our own signals, right? And to know that, but recognize other people right? Because anybody around me that was listening to him probably thought, what a little stink pot, <laughs> right? And that's sometimes where we first go to with each other, not recognizing that somebody else is in a fear and stress and anxiety moment. You know, can we help each other with these, you know, maybe you don't know somebody well enough to say, okay, you need to breathe now, <laughs> And tell me what's really going on, what you're really upset about. But at least it gives us a, a chance to have more compassion for somebody else in a situation. If we can see those signals in somebody else as well as ourselves. And number three, 
Number three really helps us hone in on those things, and that's practicing time in the silence. Because when we are silent, we are able to really hear ourselves and the universe and divine. The quote from um, James Philip Freeman is, you do not have to cajole or coerce God. Divine love has already encompassed the fulfillment of your needs. Your prayers only have to change you. So the silence is for us, not to change the outside, but for us to fully recognize what is going on, both on the inside and the outside, and to be in that place. I'm going to ask you to share some sounds with me with some affirmations to bring us into that spot for the next couple of minutes. And if you would breathe, and in this silence, to listen and feel the sound of your own breath. And with your breath in your heart, feel with these statements, feel for you right now. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I am divine intelligence. I am divine intelligence. I see with the eyes of spirit. I see with the eyes of spirit. All power is given unto me in mind and body. All power is given unto me in mind and body. I am unfettered and unbound. I am unfettered and unbound. I am the perfect expression of divine love. I am the perfect expression of divine love. Divine order is established in my mind and body. Divine order is established in my mind and body. I walk in paths of righteousness and peace. I walk in paths of righteousness and peace. Deeper is the silence of the peace within you. Deeper is the silence where you commune with spirit. And the silence is strength for the tired body. And the silence is the light for the joyless mind. In the silence is the love for the lonely spirit. In the silence is peace for the troubled heart, where the workday worries fade away. In the silence, the whole body 
the whole being becomes a place of prayer, a holy temple set upon a hill. There God becomes a living presence. There you remember the divine that you are. All stress, anxiety, and fear gets put in its place. Becomes part of our awareness. And take a nice breath. This practice is a forever practice. It's not just when we feel our world is coming to an end. But this practice of silence and reminding ourselves who we are and checking in with ourselves and put all of that into place. And we won't, as Terry McKenna says, be betting against ourselves in worry. Amen. Yeah.